Uh, we're excited about having you all here for today's plenary session, and, and I'm really excited about what we're going to be talking about, because one of the things that we're going to be looking at is how our, how business and community leaders across the state are, are viewing things in Mississippi as it relates to our economy, as it relates to workforce, as it relates to other issues that all put pressures on those things as well. We've got a wonderful panel today, and we're excited about what we're doing. But before we get started, I'm going to introduce Brian Lagg with Blue Cross and Blue Shield, who is sponsoring this plenary session and also sponsors the MEC tours each year, where we gather a lot of the information that we use to help develop the programs, the solutions, the initiatives that we focus on here at MEC. So at this time, please welcome Brian Lagg. Thank you, Scott. It's good to be here today. Uh, 75 years, that's a wonderful thing to be celebrating. Uh, since 2006, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Mississippi has partnered with MEC on an annual tour. And that annual tour is not just an opportunity for us to go into these various communities across the state and visit with business and community leaders. It's an opportunity to hear from the boots on the ground what is important to the different communities, regions, what are the obstacles that they face. And so um, the 2024 Amplify Tour, which we're very proud to be part of, is going to continue to build on those prior year success stories. The last report on the Securing Mississippi's Future, that information was gleaned from these various surveys. Um, great interaction. Um, and while there are common themes, obviously, across the state. There are elements that vary from region to region, north, delta, central, and coast. And so it's great to hear from all of you across the state. Um, one of the things that we want to do is continue to get that input, which is a vital reason for the tour. Um, likewise, the information gathered not only from this year's tour, but from our panel discussion today, that's going to help frame a lot of the priorities and initiatives for MEC heading into the future. And so I'll give you an example in a minute of how we've taken that practical feedback and actually done something with it. Um, again, one of the things that we want to focus on, obviously, when you think economic development, you think education, infrastructure, workforce development. One of the things we often lose sight of is health, a healthier employee. That makes for a healthier employer and that makes for more vibrant communities. Not just for businesses to stay, but for businesses to be attracted to. And so one of our goals on the tour, along with Scott and the MEC team, is to highlight that. I want to just briefly give you some examples of what we're trying to focus on so that you'll hear these innovations and evolutions. One, focusing on primary care. You know, that's the root of uh, finding and addressing health risk before it materializes. Two, provider innovations. Uh, you hear about it all the time with the workforce changes, AI, machine learning. Uh, similar in healthcare. You can do surgeries now in an ambulatory outpatient setting that take five hours from start to finish that used to require three or more days of hospitalization. And we all know coming out of COVID, hospital's the last place you want to be, right? But not only are those procedures lower cost, they actually have higher quality outcomes. And then finally, coming specifically from the tour in the Delta, we heard over and over again that transportation and time away from work is a major obstacle, probably like that all over the state. So we have invested in something that looks more like a rock and roll tour bus. I call it Big Blue. It's a blue mobile unit. And what we have done is we have taken that with healthcare providers into the communities, actually parking that in the um, workforce parking lot, schedule it, nurse practitioners, wellness coaches. We have taken one of the larger employers in the Delta from 9% of those members going for their annual wellness visit to just under 70% in six months. So those are just some examples of how innovation and this tour are actually meeting Mississippians where they are. So thanks again to Scott, MEC, and all of you here and uh, celebrating 75 wonderful years and many more to go. Thank you. Th thank you, Brian. Uh, I, I guess it's the first time I'd heard it uh, being called Big Blue. 
But the, uh, I always thought it more like, a, for those of us who grew up in small towns, a bookmobile. You know, so yeah, there may be a few people in the room that know that. We're, we're, getting our, we're getting our mic squared away. We had a, a little feedback a second ago. And now that he's working on that, we're going to go ahead and get rolling. I'm very excited about today's panel because these are, these are folks that are going to help us digest kind of what we're learning on the tour. And I'm going to just, just introduce them as we go down the line. On the, on the end down here is Bill Cork. Bill is the Mississippi Development Authority Executive Director and Chief Economic Development Officer for the state of Mississippi. He's been a leader in economic development for over 30 years and boasts, you know, really extensive experience in a lot of areas. Industrial park planning, rails, ports, you, you name it, he, is, he has been part of that, that process. In his, in his current role, uh, serving as it, he's really been instrumental in helping lead our state. And y'all probably, there's probably not a person in this room that hadn't heard about what's happened over the last three or four months with all the, the tremendous investment that we've had here in Mississippi. Uh, prior to being an MDA, he was with the Hancock uh, uh, County Port uh, and Harbor Commission. Uh, he is a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps. Thank you for your service, Bill. And uh, he earned a Master's of Urban and Regional Planning from the University of Illinois. So please welcome Bill Cork. Margaret Barnes uh, serves as the state chair of the Mississippi Committee of Employer Support and Guard Reserve. Uh, she, the US, uh, ESGR is a defense department program that promotes cooperation and understanding between, between businesses and uh, reserve employees. Uh, a lifelong resident of Mississippi. Uh, I, I learned reading her bio, she's from Waynesboro, which uh, we were probably neighbors and didn't know it. I grew up very close to there. And uh, she's got a, a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Southern Mississippi, a master's from South Alabama, and a master's of strategic studies from the U.S. Army War College. So welcome, Margaret. <laughs> Dr. Courtney Taylor serves as the executive director of Accelerate Mississippi, uh, taking on that role, what, about a month ago. Uh, we, we were very excited to see Courtney move into that role after serving as, as deputy director uh, at Accelerate at a time when, when, when the office of workforce development is really creating you know, kind of its, its path of what it's going to be and how, it, how it's going to be structured. So uh, bringing, bringing her in has been a big plus for us and, and we're very excited about that. Prior to uh, coming to Accelerate, she was with uh, East Mississippi Community College uh, and then prior to that she was in the state of Alabama working in the community college system there. She has uh, earned her uh, doctorate from, in human capital development from the University of Southern Mississippi and holds a master's degree in management from Troy, uh, I almost said Troy State, Troy University, and a bachelor's from the University of West Alabama. So we welcome you, Courtney. And our final speaker is Chris Bennett. I had an opportunity to meet Chris just a few weeks ago, and the issue that, that Chris, we're gonna to talk to Chris about is an issue that's very important to a lot of us uh, here in uh, Mississippi and that is, that is child care. He is the CEO and, and co-founder of Wonder School, a leading uh, provider of child care solutions that enables families to access affordable child care within minutes of their home. Uh, prior to Wonder School, he led commercial real estate investment and he is a graduate of the Wharton School, uh, a graduate in, uh, bachelor's in economics from the Wharton School, at the University of Pennsylvania. So please welcome Chris. I again want to thank Brian and Blue Cross for helping sponsor not only today's session, but sponsor our, our tour that allows us to get this information. What we have been doing is, and, and we're going to put the power up point up, and we're going to run through a few slides of, of information here as we go, uh, if we could. And um, what we have been doing on our, on our tour is actually asking people to fill out information prior to us going to a meeting to discuss what's happening at the tour. What, what we have learned is if we ask in advance, we get, I think, very honest answers. So one of the first questions we ask is a typical question that you see on really kind of any type of survey is, is, are things headed in the right direction? And we ask it from an economic standpoint. So what we learned is that 73% of those that, that, that were surveyed believe that our economy is headed in the right direction. And when you, and when you think about it, Really, that's a strong number given all of the things that we've had to do across the state. When you have almost two-thirds of Mississippians that feel that way, 
you really feel good about where you are. So, Bill, I'm going to start with you, and if you would talk a little bit about, you know, there's been a lot of economic pressures lately, and especially from a national perspective, uh, but you look at these results, the positive feelings, we, we talked briefly about that this morning, but obviously, in addition to things being good, the recent announcements are, are playing a big role of, of people having a very optimistic uh, opinion of what's happening in Mississippi. Uh, what, what are you hearing out there when you're, you're out in the field across the state? Well, thank you, uh, Scott. This has been a great opportunity to speak to the community and, and your membership about all the exciting things happening in mighty Mississippi. Uh, I think the, the, the momentum is real. I, need, I know Governor Reeves used that as kind of a campaign slogan, but you can feel it. Uh, you can feel it with the site selection community. Yesterday, I received an a area development magazine, which is a magazine. Uh, the, edit, the editorial board of that magazine has a, um, uh, has a, has, is a made up of site selection consultants throughout the United States. They did a survey of them, and they also did a massive survey of corporations. And what they found was that, um, that, the, that the South, Central South, including Mississippi, Louisiana, Tennessee, Arkansas, and Alabama, has 93% of, uh, of the ongoing site selection cases going on in the United States today. 93% of site selectors are looking at this area to place new business. Uh, the, the eastern part of the South is a close second at, at a couple of percentage points behind. The rest of the nation isn't even close. And so this momentum is real because we are seeing real activity every day and we're at the top of the class in receiving that activity. Obviously, the closings help with that momentum, the, the big announcements we've had. But uh, we've done over $22 billion in capital investment and about 20,000 jobs in the first four years of the Reeves administration. We have $50 billion in capital investment and 20,000 jobs in our pipeline today. And uh, that doesn't even include early stage inquiries that we've received from major corporations that haven't told us what their investment is at. So I think the, the, um, the, the momentum is real. I think the perception that you're all feeling that something special is happening is really happening. Uh, but from MDA standpoint, it's only 73% and we're missing the other quarter of the population that doesn't feel like they're experiencing that. And I think our goal at MDA is to make sure that the whole state is experiencing this boom, not just certain parts of it. And so that's our challenge. And that's what we're hoping to work with the rest of the state to solve in the coming years. You know, you, you touched on something just now about the perception and, and kind of where the focus is. I, I was told by somebody just prior to the, the AWS announcement that when this happens, it's going to change how people view our state. How big a deal was landing those two major uh, investments in such a short period of time? It put us on the global stage in a way we haven't really experienced. I just came back from uh, about 10 days on the road. I was at the Site Selectors Guild Conference two weeks ago, starting Wednesday in Nashville. There was the talk of the entire conference. Everybody's like, Mississippi, what the hell is going on? You know? And then I left for Europe, and I spent seven days in Europe, five cities in seven days, so it wasn't very glamorous. Uh, everywhere we went and every CEO we talked to, mentioned Mississippi's recent successes. So um, the perception is real and it's global and it's in the right audiences. The people that we need to have getting this message are getting it. And so I think we all have a lot to be proud of because we did this as a team. Well, and, and I think there's, there's a lot of good things happening. The next slide that's gonna come up is going to actually look at workforce development. And, and are we doing a good job in training our workforce? And, and, and I, I shared these numbers with the panels, and, and one of the things that we saw, Courtney, is that, you know, when you see this type of deal, where it's, it's a slight majority, about 53% think we're, we're doing what we need to do to train the workforce, uh, you may say, well, that's, that's, you know, that's some mixed reviews. Well, at the end of the day, though, I truly believe, and I, I really don't think I would be too far off base on this one, had we asked this question just three years ago, it would probably have been about 25% that felt that way. And three years ago was about the time we, we established the Office of Workforce Development, and a lot's been happening there. So, you know, when you think about it from the perspective of everything going on, the coordination that we're working for, 
what are the really, you know, what are the things that we're looking at that's going to really improve, you know, opportunities for training and then, and then measuring the outcomes that go along with that? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Can you all hear me? Okay. Can they hear me? Okay. I hear it now. Okay, great. Sorry. Uh, so ultimately, as, as we've gotten going, it's really been focused on plugging the immediate uh, triage, the gaps, um, and, and as we look at the workforce, I agree, public, public perception is really hard where workforce is concerned because most people don't really understand what workforce is. Um, we kind of take the approach where, where we're trying to intersect workforce and education um, instead of keeping them separate because I don't know anybody that's not going to go to school hoping they get a job at some point. So, so trying to get all that stuff together. But ultimately, um, we, we, as we've gotten started, we focused heavily on getting the uh, equipment mobilized, the training programs that we could. We were fortunate to have an influx of, of dollars to be able to invest in programs that we knew we needed at the time. Um, but it continues to be how to get more people into those programs, which is really challenging. Humans go to other humans for advice. They very, and TikTok maybe, but they very rarely go to uh, a website cold to say, oh, I wonder what this company in my community is doing and who they're hiring. It's just not how people operate. So they, they go to other humans. And, and if we're not careful, and, and I think in, in most states uh, in the country, it has traditionally been a, a blind leading the blind. People know what they did to get where they are, so that's what they share. Or they share, don't do what I did, go do this other thing. Uh, my parents' generation shared, do, do the exact opposite of what I did. Um, I didn't have an option but to go to school. That was the only one that was ever presented to me, was go to college, get out of Baldwin County, Alabama, and don't come back um, because there's no jobs here. Now Now that I'm older, people are like, I want to go to Baldwin County and retire. Um, <laughs> it's like, y'all can have it, I'm good. But, but I think ultimately um, with, with this, we have to get more people earning a living wage, and that is a lot more complicated than it seems. We say we've got to get more people uh, earning more money, but also as part of that, we can't control that. We can train 10,000 people. That doesn't mean 10,000 people are going to work. Humans do the most miraculous thing, and it's whatever they want to do. Um, and and so, so we have to take a really targeted approach to it. Um, we have to make sure that we are also training humans to uh, improve the productivity of the organization they're going to work for, and that's often lost in the workforce space. Um, that is something we can control, Scott. We can improve quality. Uh, we can improve uh, quality of our efforts, quality of the output, which is the student, um, and make sure that as, a, as an industry, uh, we are working really hard to be honest with our communities, with each other about the options that exist and the options that need to exist. Um, we don't have unlimited resources. Nobody does. And, and so really being targeted um, and setting priorities for those resources is, is hard because there's always going to be somebody pulling at you. Um, and so, so that's kind of, a, I jokingly say, my job is to frustrate everybody a little bit. Um, and I'm a sister to two brothers, so I'm really good at it. Um, but, but I think, you know, as we walk forward, um, we can't just simply look at increasing uh, the inputs into human capital infrastructure because it's very expensive. Um, we also can't fool ourselves that we're going to put $100 million into a multi-billion dollar system and it is somehow just going to change everything. It can change some things, though. And so being honest about what it's going to change and what it can do is really important. And I think it's more important to the individuals in our communities than anybody um, so that they understand this is what I can make. This is the opportunity ladder, as some people call it. Um, these are the things that I can do uh, to be more productive and live right here. Um, and it, it's complicated and it's challenging, um, but it's also fruitful and rewarding <laughs> when we're able to do it. You know, I'm very fortunate that I get to work closely with, with the two of you and, and, and serve on the State Workforce Investment Board and understand what's happening in, in workforce. Courtney, one of the things that has been a big part of this is focusing on in-demand jobs. And I know you all are kind of identifying those. But to take that a step further, kind of what are you learning and, and how can businesses, how the folks in this room, how can they help in that process to make sure we're doing this the right way? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, showing up is a big one. Um, it is hard and complicated, and I could sit up here, I think between the two of us, we could have a six-hour conversation on acronyms and never use an actual word, um, and we could, it'd be word soup. Um, and, and so workforce is really, really spectacular at that. But, but I think don't get lost in all of that. And, and I think you've got to show up. You know, I think you've got to ask yourself, when was the last time you were in your local school, elementary, middle, high? Um, that we need a lot of that. Um, we need people looking, uh, looking into the system, talking to the children. 
Um, but, but don't talk to the, to the young people like you would a 40-year-old. Um, you you got to get them a little bit excited. They, they've got to understand what it is you do. They don't care what you make or what you produce or what service you provide. Very, very few people do. Um, but, you know, we, we talk about plumbers. We're talking a lot right now about plumbers and electricians. And um, when I say the word plumber, I bet almost everyone in this room thought somebody unclogging toilets. That was the mental image that you got. But that's not the plumbing that we're talking about. That is vital because I don't want my toilets blocked up. But we're talking about the plumbers that piece pipes together for, for commercial companies and, and industrial companies. And so I think you've got to show up. You've got to be realistic. Uh, one of the problems that I have seen uh, across the board in every state is we talk about national averages when we're telling students how much they can make. And that's not being an honest broker. You've got to tell them what they're going to make uh, in your community as they enter your organization what's most reasonable. Not you're going to make $100,000 as a welder. There are opportunities like that. And if that's yours, then that's fantastic. But if it's not yours, don't repeat that number. Be an honest broker with them because what happens is they get, they get dis just, just, I don't know the right word, but um, they just get disillusioned with the system when we do that. So um, you have to let your educators know. You have to let your, um, your, your students know, you know, your brand is important to you. It probably doesn't matter to them unless they understand it. So help them understand it. Well, thank, thank you. I mean, I think that's the key is, is, is if we talk about getting businesses to understand, you know, getting businesses to understand what's available, we also got to make sure that the others, are, the, the workforce is understanding yep. the, what's available as well. The, the next slide that I'm going to show uh, that's coming up, I, I got a feeling that this, the numbers on this one probably doesn't surprise Chris at all. We asked the question about is quality childcare a barrier to workforce? And 86% said yes, with a number of those strongly agreeing that this is an issue. Uh, you know, I don't think necessarily, Chris, that this is um, something that is unique to Mississippi because I've heard others talk about it. But what are you seeing, particularly in, in your business across the country, as it relates to child care? Hello? Yeah, thank you for the question. So uh, what we're seeing is there's a child care shortage all over the country. And, um, and we're seeing employers um, struggling to, to make sure that their employees get access to childcare. What we find is that um, childcare is you know, incredibly important to make sure that there are enough jobs in an economy. Um, what we do at Wonder Schools, we support individuals in starting home-based childcare programs. I went to a home-based childcare program as a kid, and I had a great experience in the program, and the woman who started it um, still runs it today. She grew it to a center, has been able to build an incredible business off of it. But what we find is when someone starts a home-based childcare program, they create a ton of jobs. So the people who are able to put their kids into the program are able to work. Uh, the person who starts the program is creating a job. The, the folks that that person hires, and it's both short-term and long-term. The children that are in that program, those children are more likely to be gainfully employed later on in life when they're adults. Um, so what we're seeing is um, there's just a there's just a, a national crisis right now, um, and we need more childcare. So one, and you, we got a couple of slides we, that you it provided to talk a little bit about how one how Wonder School is is set up and how it works. So we'll we'll go to those slides. Um, can you talk a little bit about what this process does and how someone who may be interested in this I guess home based approach to because when I, when you and I first had a chance to sit down and talk about it it kind of came to light that sometimes you're, while the centers are important, their structure doesn't always accommodate someone who works a, a different schedule or works, you know, has other things that go along with that. Yeah, so um, um, when I graduated from college, I, was, I became an investor and I became a, a real estate private equity investor. And one of the things I learned is how to analyze a business pretty quickly. And uh, when, I, when I moved to, to San Francisco to, to start this company, um, one of the things I noticed is that a lot of child care providers could actually build pretty solid businesses. They just needed help running the business appropriately. So um, we built this company um, with, with that idea in mind. Um, we started child care programs all across the United States. And um, through an incredible partnership here in Mississippi um, with the Department of Health and Human Services, we, uh, 
we're creating childcare programs all across the state, and we're working with individual childcare providers to help them run their businesses better. Along with that, we've launched a substitute teacher pool because what we found is that um, child care providers who have capacity are having a really difficult time uh, making sure that they have enough staffing to be able to support that capacity. So um, what we do is uh, we've created a substitute teacher pool. We have over 3,000 applicants who signed up. We have over a 70% match rate with um, child care providers. And what we found is that we need to, we need to invest in infrastructure for child care to make sure that there's enough child care um, across the country. So, um, you know, what we've done is we've, we, we work with both governments, but we also have direct partnerships with employers. So we have partnerships with employers all across the United States where we'll work with an employer and say, you know, you, you have this idea that you think you should need, you need to start a center because that's the sort of status quo. Everyone's got a center. But what we find is that the cost of starting a center is very high for most businesses. The, the cost to operate a center is very high, and the and the and the cost to keep enough teachers in there is is really difficult. What we find is that if a teacher starts a home-based childcare program, they can typically earn two times, sometimes three times more than if they worked at a childcare program themselves. And what we are able to do is get programs open in close to about eight to twelve weeks. Whereas centers take, you know, years, you know, there's all this uh, buying land and getting the, and, 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 and setting up the infrastructure, there's all this money and time that goes into it, where we can stand up childcare programs quickly. What we also find, and, and, and um, I spent some time talking to some um, employers here in Mississippi, and one of the things we found is with shift work, it's really difficult to, to, to operate with uh, the, the traditional um, center model. Um, with home-based providers, we're able to provide a lot more flexibility where um, providers are able to be open, you know, um, around shifts, um, can be open 24 hours is what we've seen. And, uh, and the other exciting thing about it is that with home-based childcare programs, you can actually put them anywhere. So if you have employees that are traveling from a long distance, you can put those programs in the community where, um, the peop where, where, where employees live. So what I always say, if there's people and if there's homes we can solve childcare and uh and and that is and what's also interesting is it's not it's like right in front of us but we don't often see it um oftentimes when i'm talking to folks they'll say oh yeah i don't know much about home-based childcare but you know what i actually went to a home-based childcare program as a kid or my child's in a home-based childcare program but the idea of actually investing in it is something that's still a new idea and so that's something that we're really excited to, to help folks understand and, and you mentioned your partnership that with you know the here in Mississippi how how's that been received as you as you've gone through those that process of getting these started in Mississippi and and how many are, are here in Mississippi now so we're starting um, about 50 programs here in the state and um, what we found is that um, Folks sometimes just don't believe it. It's a little unbelievable. Like what we find is that if you start a home-based program, you can make about um, $50,000 uh, $50, $50, $50, a year. And, um, and we're helping folks you know, create their own business. And, and just like the program that I went to as a kid, you can start off in home and then grow it into a center. The woman who um, runs um, the center-based program now, she owns three homes. Her, she didn't go to college, but her daughter's going to medical school. Um, she's been able to create an incredible life for herself. And um, it's just a little unbelievable because all of the, all of the, the press around childcare is that it's a bad business, that it, it, it doesn't work. When in reality, it act, there's so much demand. We know there's so much demand for childcare. It's just that we need to support the, the, the providers in being strong business women, essentially. Yeah. Well, you know, when we talk, we talk about all the different opportunities to improve workforce, I think one of the areas that, that we see in Mississippi is how do we partner with the military and how do we partner with, with those that are serving in the military. Uh, the next slide uh, talks about, we asked the question about what do you see is, is some of the things that we can do to really help us understand how we do it and if you could, if you look at this slide it, it's there's really a lot of mixed you know there's a lot of mixed results here we uh, you know you see that some people see that you know mentoring some career assistance tax incentives a, a variety of things they, they all got a, a kind of all seem to be important 
Well, Margaret, when you think about this, having such a variety, what, what I'd like to know is when you see this, what do you think about is the things that employers need to focus on as it relates to what you're doing? And then if you could also tell us a little bit about the employer support in Guard Reserve uh, and what y'all are doing there to help, help make those connections. Thank you, Scott. Um, first, I would like to express my gratitude and thanks to you for asking me to come today to talk about our men and women who have served in the military uh, and how they would relate uh, to uh, the workforce in Mississippi. These military men and women have made great sacrifices. And as you can see uh, from people that you already know, uh, Bill, that's on the stage, they can make great contributions to, to our state workforce. Um, as we acknowledge how valuable they are in the skills that they have, uh, looking at the, the diagram, the transferable skills that are gained through the military provide a wealth a wealth of untapped potential that these uh, military people can provide in the workforces. Um, I have with me today, and, and, and Chris Griffins can speak to that a little bit more, and then I'll give you some more information about the employer um, um, support of the Guard and Reserve. He is the um, employment director of uh, Work for Warriors, and Work for Warriors Thank you, Scott. And um, this, this program has some tremendous uh, growth potential within the state, especially within transferring um, the skills from military to civilian. And he has some success stories that I would like for him to talk to you about. Chris. Thank you, Margaret. Good morning, everyone. My name is Chris Griffiths. Uh, as Margaret had mentioned, I work with Mississippi Military Department uh, with the Work for Warriors program. Uh, and just looking at the diagram here, I can see it's it's pretty even there, close to 25% on all uh, all those factors there. And Work for Warriors would be able to hit about 50% of those when you're talking about career assistance, career development, employment assistance, uh, and helping to define those transferable skills. Um, it, it takes, I think, work on the, on the part of the employer uh, as well as those veterans and military service members uh, to make that, make that work, to make that happen. Um, and if there's some dialogue there between the, you know, hiring uh, and the individuals that are trying to get hired, that certainly assists the process. So um, what Work for Warriors does, as I said, career development, and when it comes to defining transferable skills, um, there's a number of credentials and certifications that you'll get uh, depending on your military occupation in the military. So that's something to be aware of um, and to be open to how those military members are articulating. Uh, there may be military jargon, uh, other uh, things that might not be as well understood, but if you can come from a more open place, that will certainly assist. Uh, some. Of I would like to mention some um, policy legislation that have been passed uh, in the past few years that is, I think, think quite relevant to this subject I just wanted to make people aware of. Um, in regards to the commercial driver's license, um, for those military service members that are in particular uh, military occupations, they're able to um, through their training and their experience, get waivers to be able to get that license within the state. Um, and of course, if anyone's interested in this, I can elaborate more in the future. Uh, if you're interested, uh, please just communicate with me. And then also uh, with the Mississippi Department of Public Safety, um, basically they are more accepting now of military training uh, as an, uh, in lieu of or as an equivalency to Mississippi civilian police officer training. Um, it is on a case-by-case -case basis by the Board of Law Enforcement uh, Training and Standards. But uh, I think that's a really great practice to be able to accept military police training um, and be able to do refresher courses, to be able to streamline that process to uh, police employment within the state. Uh, those are some general comments that I wanted to make. Uh, please 
communicate with me uh, at any time and I'll be able to elaborate on other initiatives that are going on in the state that are in regards to veteran uh, and military service. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I was particularly excited uh, about the um, um, the transfer of skills from the, especially with the MPs, to uh, the police force, the security forces within Mississippi, because you always hear about the shortage of police officers, and that is something that if you get with Chris later, he can give you more information on if uh, you're with a municipality. Now, just to speak briefly, I know I'm standing between you and your uh, lunch today about the employer support of the Guard and Reserve. The employer support of the Guard and Reserve uh, was created to uh, bridge a gap in, um, in uh, understanding uh, between employers and military service members if they're still active um, in the Guard and Reserve and that's all across all branches. And as you know, we are, there's certain upticks in deployment of soldiers and they do have to go out for training. So if employers don't understand um, all of the policies that are surrounded with guard members and reserve members that are in their workforce. We provide training uh, and informational uh, briefings to the employers, and we also brief all of our guard and reserve members in the state, which is, is way over 20,000 uh, combined together. Um, one of the things that I will say to employers that you might not be aware of is that every Guard and Reserve member that works for you gets a listing of any dates that they will be out excluding deployments uh, for a whole year in advance, that so they can give those to you. So if that is some information uh, that you uh, would like for us, we've got about 33 volunteers across the state that will be happy to come to your uh, agencies and uh, brief you. There are also certain awards that you can get. One award is uh, from the Secretary of Defense. And this past year, Ingalls Shipbuilding, among some others, we did nominate for those. But it's very competitive across the United States. Those are employers that go above and beyond what they need to do by law uh, in reference to supporting uh, their military. Military. Well, thank you. I, I'm going to take. I'm going to stand up so I can see the screen just to make sure. I don't, I, I've looked at these numbers backwards and forwards, but I also want to make sure that I'm not not missing something here a, as it relates to um, what we're doing. Our, our, when we did the survey, we really looked at a variety of things. So when we asked what's the most important component as it relates to health care, and you heard Brian talk about this a little while ago. Uh, you know, affordability and cost came up as, as the number one priority, uh, followed by quality of care. So if we could, you know, keep, keep costs down, keep quality up, some of the things that we talk about from a prevention standpoint is part of this. And then, of course, accessibility is also something that we're focused on right now is, is creating access for, for more Mississippians, particularly those that are working Mississippians. Uh, as it relates to transportation, uh, maintaining roads and bridges uh, probably is continues to be the, the top answer. Uh, I actually got a question yesterday from one of our participants from the Leadership Mississippi program, uh, who is the, the head of the Jackson Airport, said, hey, what, what, what can we do to continue to improve that? While all of these are important, I think because all of the attention has been put on roads and bridges, it doesn't surprise me that these numbers are there, but, but we're going to talk about this in a second too, Bill, because all of these relate to economic development as it goes, goes forward as well. Uh, as far as rank what we believe is the most important thing bridging the gap, number one is the K-12 accountability balancing both academics and careers. Now, as I said, this, some people in the room may not believe me, but this is not a push poll. We're asking these questions in advance before we have these discussions. This is a priority of MEC. We've talked about it being a priority of MEC. But we have got to find a way to get away from having four tests determine a school's grade and talk about how we have a student-centered approach to education and balancing the academic and the career side. Look, uh, MEC uh, about two years ago was awarded a large grant to look at uh, what we call Ascent to 55, improving post-secondary education and making sure that we're getting more people with degrees. Bachelor's degrees and beyond are extremely important, but there's a way to get there by stepping that process through. 
either credentials, associate's degrees, and building. Don't make whatever that credential is a stopping point. Figure out a way to keep it going forward so that you build on that and move through the process and there are things that are happening across the state that are doing that. Uh, providing information on career pathways at an earlier age. We're seeing a lot of efforts being put on that front and then how do we make sure that there are workplace learning opportunities so that people, so that our students have the understanding of what takes place when we go to the workplace. Uh, in terms of which area has the most impact on overall competitiveness, again, workforce training, education, and talent retention. How do we create more opportunities for young professionals to be successful here in Mississippi? Then when we ask about what is the best way to improve advanced manufacturing, a lot of things popped up because, again, and Bill, I'm going, to, I'm going to go to you to ask a question now. Manufacturing is still a big part of our economy here in Mississippi. So, of course, workforce is going to be on there, but site development and, and, and incentives, and we talked about infrastructure. Talk about how all those play a role in the work that y'all do across this, you know, in attracting people to Mississippi. Well, you're right. The talent is number one, top of mind. It has been uh, for the last several years because, as we all know, we have more jobs in Mississippi looking for people than we have people looking for jobs. And so that deficit is going to create obviously a gap that's going to bring it top of mind. Um, increasingly, what we're seeing, Scott, is that energy cost and availability is now moving into the top three. Uh, and the reason for that is because these advanced manufacturing operations and data centers are massive power users. And so a lot of the story around the AWS, for instance, was around power. The hidden headline behind the EV battery project in TVA territory was availability of power. It didn't get a lot of headlines, but power now, and because power is, think about power if you know your physics lessons. Power's work, it's physical work. It's what your electrons use in your brain to process information. Electricity is, is essentially work um, put into a different form. And so as we have less talent, companies are driving more robotics, more uh, in, in AI and machine learning. Power is going to be essential. So if Mississippi wants to be an advanced manufacturing state, it's going to have to have the power and it's going to have to have the people to run the machines. And that's the massive transformation. It's only after we get through those things that you've got to have the land and the water and the sewer and, you know, the environmental capabilities and access to transportation. But the key drivers in, in, in 2024 are talent and power. Incentives... Um, is becoming more important than it used to be. We had kind of a waxing and waning period on incentives. It used to be everybody was shopping for incentives because there were few places for people to go and companies had, it was a kind of a buyer's market, right? So the companies could pick and so they bid the prices of these projects up. Then as that market became more constrained and products started to dry up, it became a seller's market. We're not having to pay as much for projects as we used to in the past. But that's changing because the size of the capital investment of these projects is absolutely enormous. We have probably over two dozen projects in our pipeline today, over half a billion dollars each. And a $300 million project 20 years ago would have been huge. So, you know, the incentives are really designed on a tax environment uh, standpoint but also how to, up, uh, how to offset some of those upfront capital costs becoming increasingly important. So you have to be nimble in this business. You have to adapt. It's not a static environment. The, the, the market changes. The incentives change. And, and, and things like speed to market, because now time is money. Think of how much inflation has moved in the last few years. If a company started a project six months ago and had bid prices on their construction materials, six months later their project could be out of the money just because of time. So if you, the state, the local community, if you're the delay, you're costing the company money. So speed to market is the new incentive as well. It's how fast can you get these projects out of the ground. So I'm going to make a plug while I got the mic, uh, Scott, because the legislature's in, in full swing right now. We're talking appropriations. The governor's seeking $100 million in site development money. Every single one of these major announcements that we have announced has taken advantage of this program in the past. We've spent over $80 million of state money, leveraged that into a $120 million program over the last few years. If we don't continue to invest in product so that we can get speed to market, we will not be competitive for these programs of the future. So 
Um, that's my shameless advertisement for our, our site development program. Well, it's, it's a big part of what, what we're doing in, in trying to be ready and have all those things in place for success. Uh, the, the next slide is our, our final slide that, that we want to talk about, and that is, Courtney, career coaching is something that we have been very involved in at MEC, very supportive of. Uh, it, I know you didn't have enough on your plate at Accelerate, so we put it there. Now, there was a reason Accelerate is able to manage the grants and get them out so that the, the communities are working with individuals. But it, if you look at this question, what you're seeing is it's all about integrating businesses into the process, helping the career coaches understand how to make connections and all that. Talk a little bit about how businesses can play a role. Again, similar to what you said, getting into the schools is part of it. But how can businesses play a role in, in helping this career coach program, which is, if I understand, about an 80 percent of high schools across the state. Our goal is to talk about the uh, bill, talking about the legislature. We got, we, got, we got funding that we're trying to push for for, for, for Courtney and her team as well. Uh, talk a little bit about how businesses can help begin that integrating process. Yeah, sure. Thank you. First of all, thank for your thank you for your support and and for everybody that supports that program. It it makes a difference. Uh, you, like I said earlier, you've got to talk to students. I think um, getting in the schools is really important. Um, understanding the bigger picture and trying to connect with the career coaches give you essentially a single point to communicate with instead of trying to go to 15 different instructors because that can be really challenging. Um, I think walking into the door is really important. When you get the opportunity to go talk to children, be specific um, about what you have, but also take time to talk to the coaches. Don't talk at them. Um, talk with them that you, you've got humans that are trying to manage a lot of different things um, I, I, I'm not one of those humans for lots of reasons if you know me personally, but um, but, but they're doing a, a heavy lift with this and, and they are trying their hardest to manage the equities of the student the companies the the schools You know, it is a challenging deal um, I think you can also just let them know you're here for them when you see them um, support them um, be genuine about it, but um, take them a cookie every once in a while. They could use a cookie. Um, but, but I think ultimately un try to understand the bigger picture with this uh, because it, it, will, it does frustrate the system. It's designed to frustrate the system simply by being at our office, um, by working through uh, local nonprofits instead of working through uh, established infrastructure. It is, it is designed to kind of frustrate that a little bit um, so that we start making sure we get all the information we need to the students. It's not about option A. It's not about option B. It's not about going to college or not going to college. It's about knowing that all of those things are <coughs> options for our kids and, and every opportunity you can get to share with them. Don't just share with them the jobs you need the most. You know, I need a, a thousand production workers, but you're also going to need a hundred engineers. And so as you get the opportunity to talk to children and students and adults and everybody, make sure you're, you're kind of walking the tightrope between both of those so that everybody understands uh, that you can really pick your place uh, in, in your culture, in your community, and in your company uh, and be honest and realistic about it. Well, I will tell you, every one of the topics that we've discussed uh, over the last 50 minutes are, are very important. Uh, there, there's no question that we've got a lot of work to do. And I think what this panel has helped me think through is, okay, how do we as MEC continue to bring these to the forefront? How do we continue to talk about them? How do we look for additional ways to continue the conversation, which is exactly what we're hoping to do? But I do have one thing that I would like to ask of y'all that's in the audience. If we go back to the PowerPoint real quick, this QR code will take you to this survey. We're continuing to collect survey input. We're continuing to, to gather the data. Uh, our tour will uh, continue throughout the rest of the, the summer months and, and we'll wrap up. And, and really what we're looking to do is get a complete data set from all regions of the state of Mississippi. So I'm sure some of you in here have, have already taken this because I, I've seen some of you that have been to our, our meetings. Uh, if, if we haven't made it to your part of the state yet, we will be coming very soon. But take a moment to fill out the survey because the more responses we get, the better data that we will have. And just like what we did in securing Mississippi's future, uh, when we released that in 2022, that was a result of listening to what members of MEC 
business leaders, community leaders all across the state were saying about what is important to them. That helps us develop these programs. That helps us develop where we want to go. So again, I want to thank our, would y'all please join me in thanking the panel. A, a great deal of tremendous insight among these, these, these folks up here on the stage with me today that, that really understand and, and are experts in their area. And we want to be able to continue to rely on them, continue to focus on these issues. And as we go forward, I, I think you'll do that. Again, a special thanks to Blue Cross and Blue Shield for not only their sponsorship of today's session, but their sponsorship of the tour that allows us to come out into your communities and hear what you have to say. Because as you're going to learn in a few minutes, in the 75 years that MEC has been in existence, one of the keys to our success is listening to what you across the state are telling us as we develop policy and work with our state leaders to find a way to have real solutions. So again, thank you all for being here.